Thank you all. We are going to turn next to some of the challenges posed by emerging technologies uh, and how to address some of those challenges, including a further discussion of the Aspen Cybersecurity Group's recommendations in this area, of which you heard a little about earlier today. Um, so if you would please help me welcome in our next panel, which includes Bruce Schneier, the author of Click Here to, Ki to Kill Everything, Maureen Allison of Johnson & Johnson, Brad Murray, Brad Mayorino from Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, and the Aspen Institute's Executive Director for the Cyber and Technology Program, Garrett Graff. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to for this panel discussion to talk a little bit about um, some of the group work that we have been doing in the Aspen Cybersecurity Group. Uh, particularly in the realm of ensuring confidence and security in emerging technologies, particularly in the IoT space. And uh, some of this conversation is going to be based off of this uh, white paper that we issued today with the uh, IoT first principles of security, which Maureen has worked uh, hard on over the course of this year. <laughs> Maureen, the CISO for Johnson & Johnson, um, Bruce Snyder, uh, General Tech Provocateur, <laughs> and Brad Mariano um, from Booz Allen, a uh, member of the, the cyber group um, and uh, CISO um, uh, at uh, a number of number. leading companies <laughs> which have various IoT work. Um, I thought I would actually start with Bruce. Um, you and I were talking before dawn this morning uh, about your new book, Click Here to Kill Everyone. Um, and the idea, a book that uh, grew out of, in some ways, your frustration with buying IoT devices. Um, and if you could sort of tell the story a little bit of the genesis of that book and sort of the fears that it raised about where this, uh, this trend of IoT is going. You know, the book's really written about an internet that can affect the world in a direct physical manner and how that changes everything in security. It used to be about data, and now it's about objects and people. And that's the IoT. Uh, I think the anecdote you're thinking of, not, it wasn't really the genesis of the book, was helping a friend uh, try to buy a baby monitor. And, right, I'm a security guy, I'm a privacy guy, I can, I can read tech specs, and I'm not able to figure out how they work, what the security is. I, as an expert, I'm unable to choose a baby monitor based on their security features. The data isn't there. I can't get the information. I can't get my questions answered. And this sort of very opaqueness is permeating our industry. Now, baby monitor is just privacy. When it comes to a thermostat or a car, I tried to buy a car last year and wasn't, was unable to buy one, didn't have an internet connection. I mean, they exist, but not in my fair class. <laughs> and so but I'm looking at this, this IoT, which is the computerization of everything, where it's all the problems we have in the computer field, and then robots. And that just can't end well. And that's really what, what my book is about. The provocative title is, I mean, it's really about how computers fail. We, cars fail, there are parts, parts have mean time between failures, and we have an entire ecosystem of car repair shops to deal with with how cars fail. Computers fail differently. They all work perfectly till one day when none of them do. And that failure mode is not something we're used to. So my book is trying to pull all of that together. It's primarily all about policy. This has been a great day listening to, to people before me talking about how to do this in policy, uh, the principles. I mean, this is really what we have to solve. What are the policy issues in this new world of, of dangerous computers? So, Maureen, uh, tell us a little bit about sort of how this became a focus of the work and sort of what the conversations were as the group pushed towards coming up with these first principles of security. Um, the Aspen uh, group, when we looked at it, was uh, we, we first, one of the very first things we did is we looked at all the body of work that was out there, work who had been done by NIST work who had been done by AdvaMed, which is in the healthcare sector, is one of our ruling bodies around medical devices, the FDA, uh, and industry groups, the car manufacturers. We read Bruce's book. 
um, and, and uh, looked at some of these. And in the hype, the St. Jude's uh, issue with shorting the stock on, on the healthcare devices, uh, as well as uh, Black Hat and DEF CON, uh, certainly sensationalizing um, um, how medical devices uh, could be safety issues. Uh, and we brought all that together, and we realized we didn't want to have a recapitulation in another document that said the same thing. But we also realized we needed to come, come up with something uh, fairly short, understandable by consumers. Most of the stuff out there is, is, even as a security professional, I have to ask myself, what do they really mean here? And so we came up with a, a, a fairly short document, seven general principles that uh, can be applied in different ways. In the healthcare industry, I will certainly apply them in a much different way than, say, a connected coffee pot manufacturer might have to do. Uh, but we looked at them, uh, things like our um, uh, layered security. It's not the coffee pot that's going to um, uh, be insecure, but it's going to be one where that data goes from that coffee pot. If in your house you don't allow um, how much coffee you consume out, then your privacy will never be invaded on, on whether you like decaf or, ca you know, or caffeinated or Starbucks or Folgers. Nobody will know. But if you do, then you are going to have to add some layers of protection. Additionally, as we talked, as Bruce has said, uh, uh, we call it the bill of materials. Uh, in, in the healthcare medical devices, uh, when we look at medical devices, we go through every single element in every piece of technologies that's in them to ensure what we have is secured as well as sustainable, that it can be updated, which was another uh, principle. And so we brought these together. I think you'll find them very short. Most people will um, uh, be able to read them and recognize them and apply them very quickly. And then we had a long debate on whether we should recommend a uh, consumer reports or a UL type of listing on devices, uh, and then pulled that to the side, uh, because industry will actually guide that depending upon which industry the devices are in. Bruce is already shaking no, his no, no, head. No, no, no. No, go, go get to me later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the seven principles as they were effectively boiled down is transparent, uh, that security needs to be baked in, mm -hmm. that it needs to be transparent about product safety, it needs to be transparent about product privacy, the manufacturer needs to be accountable, the, the software and the security needs to be updatable and that it needs to be layered. Mm -hmm. um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, sort of how you thought through that construct and sort of what stand, stood out to you as you were looking at this project. I, I think uh, two things came out. Is the intended purpose of the devices in one size wasn't going to fit all. Uh, if you look at IoT, uh, it can be everything from a door sensor uh, all the way up to, um, uh, in my line of work, medical devices. So one size definitely wasn't going to fit all. Uh, and then the other was, what data does it collect? You know, we heard from the, the privacy group right before us uh, that it is really about, it, it is about the data and what protections you put on in it. And are we collecting data that's going off that people don't know is being collected, and what will be the implications of that further on in a privacy world? So, Brad, uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about this in the context of consumers. We've talked a little bit about this in the context of manufacturers. Uh, how do you see the balance of the security conversation in IoT? It, you know, you, you've, you've had time in retail. You've had time in manufacturers. Um, you're a consumer in your daily life. Uh, as you sort of look at who, whose job should it be to drive the IoT security conversation? Is this something that consumers can actually take control of? Or does it need to be a, a regulatory conversation? Sort of what, who, who's ultimately going to make this happen? Yeah, so first of all, I want to start off by thanking Lisa Monaco and Maureen for the work that this team has done on these principles. 
If you haven't seen them yet, it is a very short one-page document. And I think the important point to remember is that this is a nonpartisan, cross-functional group that came together to define these and get it into a one-page document. And when I first look at the principles, I think they're the, the, they're the exact right categories that we should be focusing on. And they're high level for a reason, right? They're a set of guiding principles. I, I would classify them as this is what we need to be doing in IoT. And this is great because the team is now done with that. They've made progress. The next step now, the team's already started to work on, is how to implement those, right? And this is where I think the conversation is going to get a lot more difficult, right? Thinking about it from a risk-based approach, we can't treat all IoT devices the same, right? Maureen mentioned a couple in the, in the medical field. That's high risk. We have other differences that some devices are, if there's a security issue with it, it's a risk to itself, right? So whatever it does is at risk, whether it's a medical device or makes coffee or is an oven, you can turn on from your phone. That's a risk to itself. But then the other piece of IoT we have to think about is an IoT device can also represent risk to other IoT devices, and not just IoT devices, anything, right? So think about the Dyn attacks from a couple of years ago, the mm -hmm. dynamic DNS attacks. So I think we have to think about it in two senses. So even though a coffee machine, okay, if a coffee machine gets hacked and you know starts spitting out coffee at you know three o'clock in the morning and it shouldn't, not a big deal. But if that device is used with millions of other coffee machines to attack other devices or critical infrastructure, then it becomes a big deal. And so, sorry, Garrett, long answer to your question, but when it comes to whose responsibility should this be, I think there's a consumer part of it is for sure. And I think, to Marie's point, the, the way the principles are written, they're very easy to understand, right? Simple English, no techie talk in there. And I think once consumers can start understanding it, they can start asking for it and differentiating. Right? So buying product A versus product B because product A has that label or has that security feature. Mm -hmm. So I think consumers are going to play a big role. Bruce, what do, you th what do you think? Is that realistic? Is this something that ultimately consumers can be? I'm not a big fan of uh, consumers doing this at the, at the point of register. Right? There they are. That's when your sort of type one thinking kicks in. It's all about price. It's all about satisfaction. That's not the place where you make all these security and, and safety trade-offs. So I, in a lot of ways, principles are easy. When I was researching this, I, I found 19 different sets of principles for IoT security devices. I, I did a blog post where I listed them all. My book has one that's 20. Here's number 21. And honestly, they're all basically about the same, more or less detailed, trade differences around the edges. I mean, but that's not the hard part. The hard part is how do we get companies to implement these principles? And looking at every other industry, we don't get security and safety unless it's done by the government. And it's a combination of things. It is uh, rigid regulations. You can't drive more than 55, period. Flexible standards. You can't drive fa uh, faster than the road conditions allow. Liabilities, insurance, uh, international agreements. I mean, lots of things fall into this mix. But I actually challenge you to find another industry in the past 100 or so years that has dramatically improved safety and security without being forced to by the government. I can go through the I'm going to raise my hand. Oh, healthcare. Wait, wait. Oh, I'm going to say healthcare. Not a chance. Hey, health, it's the FDA. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's medical devices, it's food, cars, airplanes, consumer goods, workplace safety, uh, agriculture, restaurants, most recently financial products. Right? In every industry, the financial incentive is to skimp on safety and security, suffer the consequences which are minimal, and ride it out. But we taught Equifax that last year. We're teaching Facebook that today. And these companies are not going to suffer losses. They're going to just wait it out. And unless government takes any one of these, I don't even care which principle, and starts implementing it, I mean, where's my California guy, the guy in the anti-baby dropping crusade? Right? Okay, he's going to start doing that. He now has the first IoT security law. It's not that great. It's kind of vague, but it's a start. And his job is going to be to interpret what a reasonable security fit for a purpose means and enforce it. And I think that's going to be the start. And, and you know, if they had you start with these principles, that'd be great. 
and then and may we get somewhere. Well, the reason why I disagree is, is in the healthcare industry, in, in medical devices specifically, there was a group of us with the Health ISAC that came together uh, and worked with the FDA to create the um, original cybersecurity of what needed to be done. We realized as an industry that, uh, that uh, cybersecurity could have a safety impact. And the companies that came together worked with the FDA and uh, created the principles uh, that were out there uh, and, and what our protocols were. Uh, was it perfect at the time? Have we gone through and changed it? Yes, we have. Are there companies that aren't following those rules, which may be where we need the regulation? Uh, but I will tell you that um, I'm very proud of the healthcare organization. Uh, healthcare groups that I've worked with that came together um, as a need to put those cybersecurity uh, expectations in. And that included, again, a bill of materials, testing, uh, setting up websites so that if a researcher had a, uh, a, uh, a, something that they had found that was a vulnerability, that we would work with researchers, uh, that after manufacture, how we would work with CERT to put out vulnerabilities that are found after the fact, because we, like everyone else, use computer pieces that sometimes have to be patched later on, and or uh, cert, uh, CERTs from SHA-1 to SHA-2 that you have to upgrade over time. And so I do think in that, in the safety arena, and, and health, of course, being one of the primary uh, safety areas, could be a model for other areas. But will there need to be enforcement, um, as Bruce has suggested? Uh, I would say likely. And to work with the FDA. Right. right. The FDA is there. Government is in the room. Right. And if government didn't have teeth, they're not going to be as in the room. So, so yeah, working with the FDA is great. The FDA is an enforcement agency, and that's what makes them great. Yeah. So, I, I, do think, I do think a carrot approach over a stick here is going to get us farther. I mean, this is, securing IoT is hard. Doing security is hard. That, that is why we're all here today, right? And IoT, I think, presents some real challenges and a real pragmatic example. I've been in the room with some engineers talking about an IoT device, you know, that's like this big that has a very small amount of real estate. Right, so every security feature you put on that takes battery power, takes storage, takes CPU away from functionality that could be part of the product. So there's a real trade-off I think that needs to happen. So if we're talking regulation, I think we have to be really careful in how this industry is regulated. So, so what's your carrot? Your I think the carrot is customer differentiation. I think, I think well, in Maureen's example, it's, it's, it's safety. Right, I think. How about it, what's your carrot? Right? I'm a company. You want me to spend more money, reduce my features, increase my power. Yep. You said you want a carrot versus a stick. The stick is I go to jail if I don't do it. Right? I go to jail if I kill people. Yep. You want a carrot. What's my carrot? Revenue. I Product. got better revenue without listening to you. Product sales. <laughs> Product sales are great. No, if I'm comparing, if we can, if if we can take these principles and use them to educate consumers. Look, I'm Equifax. I don't even my consumers couldn't care less. They're users. They don't even know I'm using. Right? What, what's your carrot? For products? Yeah. IoT products, it's revenue. Hey, honestly, we, we haven't gotten people to make uh, pajamas that didn't burn up in fires without forcing them. Because I don't think people understand what IoT security is. One of the questions, though, Brad, that I think does make this such a uniquely challenging environment for security is you're talking, or, you know, if I have a security problem in my iPhone, yep. you know, this device lives for 18 months on average in, you know, it, Apple will update it a whole bunch of times even just within that 18 months. Um, it, you know, Bruce, in your book, you talk about sort of how we're moving towards these devices, um, you know, the connect car, which is going to be on the road for the next 30 years. You know, we're, we're putting cars out today that, you know, will, might occupy the road alongside yeah. Elon Musk's flying electric automobile uh, <laughs> powered by nuclear fusion um, in 30 years. Um, so how do you begin as, as an organization and as a customer to consider the, the downstream risk of the IoT devices that you're bringing into your lives? Yeah, I, I think one of the principles is around, I think the term is timeout. 
So after a certain period of time, if that device can't receive updates anymore or can't stay current, it would then time out that connectivity, right? So the hard part is, yeah, you're right. If you're gonna buy an oven and you're buying that oven because you can connect that oven to a phone and turn your oven on from the office before you get home to preheat it, after five years, let's say you end a life the software on that, that, that functionality, does it go away? Does it disconnect from the internet? And I think that's something that would have to be part of your sales process, that you'd have to, just like when you buy a piece of software, they all have an end of life terms in them. Mm -hmm. I think that's the same thing that's gotta happen because companies cannot keep updating IoT devices indefinitely, mm -hmm. right? Even though that oven may have a life of 20 plus years and might have multiple homeowners who use it, the software on that has an end of life. Yeah. I, I also think you're going to start seeing compute uh, right now, it's let me buy whatever is available out there. But now it's an opportunity for innovation in compute that you have something that just works for its intended purpose and doesn't come with 75,000 other features in it that you don't use that can be exploited. And, and even today, if you look at our PCs, are they really just IoT devices? Yes. <laughs> and are all of them, um, do they have, do you use all the features on it? or do you really just use three and, and that's really it, but they're there. And especially as you get into things like our supply chain, we talked a lot about supply chain today. Um, manufacturers do not change all the IT out every five years to the chagrin of the technologists in the room and the manufacturers. We don't, we don't, no one does. You're, you're looking at a factory from uh, having a 25 to 45 year lifespan. But how much IE is built in to something that doesn't ever need to talk to the internet? And so I think this idea of bill of materials, what's in it, intended purpose, uh, we're talking about it now around IoT. But as we move forward, I think it will become something that consumers may talk about. Not all of them. My grandmother probably will not be talking about that. But people as generations come next are going to start looking at this, what's in my thing? And why, why is it connecting this data about me? We saw the privacy laws. GDPR is a great example. California, as soon as it folds over, um, we likely will have to put most of the same requirements on any website that touches US citizens, because I don't know how you know a California citizen went to Massachusetts. Their IP address will be Massachusetts. So, and the law applies to them. So we now are going to be facing some things it will likely cost more to compute. And what we're going to look now is, is how can we just kind of box the compute to a very hardened thing that we can use versus having all the features that create vulnerabilities. So Bruce, uh, let me, yeah, go ahead. I think this is a good idea, but it's again, I think we have to force industry. There's a reason why your refrigerator comes with all these features that you don't want. That 10 years ago, when someone designed a refrigerator, they made a custom chip that refrigerated, and that's all it did, because that's <laughs> the way you design that. Today, you pull a generic CPU off the shelf, stick it in your refrigerator, and it comes with an IP stack, and video software, and camera software, and audio software, and you've got all those features, because that's the cheapest way to make the thing. And if we want the refrigerator manufacturers or any other manufacturers to make the thing with less functionality, which is a great idea, there has to be some financial incentive. And we don't get a massive fine from the state of California is a decent one. There are others. But I don't think it's going to be the market. I don't think people are going to say, I'm going to choose my refrigerator based on the number of unwanted features that are in the device and the, in the documentation I can't read. We, we, we're, we're trying that, and, and it's, it's not working. Now, maybe someone like Consumer Reports can step in. They, they've recently issued a report about routers, and you know, there's some pressure there. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm just not optimistic about, about consumer awareness driving this. 
because consumer awareness doesn't drive restaurant safety or, or, or anything else. It is the, the regulation that we can just sit here knowing that the ceiling will not fall on our heads and not even worry about it and not have to check the building plans before we entered this space to make sure that as museum consumers, we are in a safe building. It's, just, it's not the way society works. As long as you stay away from the albino alligator. Yeah, yeah, so yeah I think yeah. going in the, oh, he looked kind of plastic. <laughs> Those turtles didn't care. So what is the, what, what is the policy response to this? One of the conversations we ended up having um, this summer, which sort of ended up not being part of the first principles conversation, but thinking about sort of what the government's solutions to this challenge ends up looking like, is uh, someone floated the idea of uh, sort of whether we need uh, the equivalent of an IOT pension benefit guarantee corporation. Um, you know, uh, sort of the, the, uh, the PBGC, the government agency that sort of steps in when companies fail and have pension obligations. You know, should you, should we have a government agency who uh, basically IoT device manufacturers put up a bond uh, when they manufacture an IoT device that if they are not able to support it during the intended lifespan, the government sort of steps in and takes on sort of this island of misfit IoT toys to support it over the, the intended lifespan. There was a reason, Garrett, we didn't include yeah, well, it. But, that but like I guess a what really I'm, bad I'm idea. saying is like, how do, uh, what, uh, what does the policy response to this end up looking like? Is there just a, is it piecemeal regulator by regulator? Is it a new body? Sort of what's the answer for how this ends up uh, I, becoming government policy? I don't, I don't think we know. Right? And, and th this, is, this is a new thing, right? We replace these devices every three to five years. Right, that, uh, that DVR that might be part of the Dyne botnet that you don't know if it is and don't actually care, you're gonna replace that every in 10 years. Uh, that, that stove you bought, you're gonna replace every 25 years. When I bought my internet connected thermostat last year, I expect to replace it approximately never. Right, the, the, the lifespan for consumer goods is much more than our, than our phones and computers. And if you think about it, Microsoft and Apple both depreciate their operating systems pretty quickly because it gets expensive to maintain an old piece of software. Uh, you talked about cars, right? The car's gonna be on the road in 40 years. Are we gonna expect car manufacturers to maintain a test bed of 40 years times the number of models they have? Maybe, but this is a very different way of doing life cycle. We have no idea how to maintain 40-year-old software at the consumer level. Find a computer from 1978. Try to boot it up. You'll see what it's like. And, and we need to figure this out. I don't think we even have any idea what the answer is. Brad? Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think, let's think some provocative ideas here, I think. If there is a solution that we could regulate, it could be something along the lines of defining what can and can't, can't connect to the general internet, or should we create a new internet? IoT and assume a zero trust model. Because when you start thinking about regulation for this disparate set of devices from coffee pots to medical devices to airplanes and cars, I mean, I can't even imagine what that would look like from a policy standpoint. I mean, think about, I think about PCI, right, which is a very targeted regulation around credit card data, right? And think about the complexity involved in that and how long it took to get it right and how long it takes to keep it right. I couldn't even imagine what an IoT regulation would look like. So I think if we really think about it as taking a big step back and saying, should we even connect these to the internet? Should we just assume that you cannot secure IoT devices? But I want my Amazon updated. I want Netflix now. I want to be able to watch it on the airplane. The consumer right. wants right. some of these, and it's what is the risk? Yeah. Well, you would still get the functionality what I'm saying is, I mean... Her functionality is Netflix. You're not getting the functionality. I mean, her yeah. functionality, and, and she's right, demands connectivity. I mean, I want my refrigerator to do whatever magic IoT yeah. stuff it does because it's going to be cool. But connected to another internet that we knew. And, but it's two different... Don't think about data and privacy. Think about public safety. Yep. I mean, I'm con certainly concerned that someone will you know, steal my refrigerated data, but I'm much more concerned that they will spoil my meat. Or if it's a medical device or a car, will kill me, right? I don't want my DVD, DVR to be part of the Dyne botnet and take down a domain name server, 
But I also don't want these devices to harm myself or my family. So this is, there are two different threats. There's a threat I kind of don't care about. It's, you know, the threat that happens to you with my device. The threat I care about, which is when my thermostat gets shut off when I'm here and not in Minnesota, it freezes and my pipes burst. That's bad. And I don't, and my functionality in my thermostat is essential that I control it on this device because that's why I bought it. So this is, this is robustly difficult. But you know what? If I had a 55 Thunderbird, it doesn't have the same safety <laughs> features of a 2018 uh, Subaru. Uh, but uh, I take the risk. I take the risk. It probably doesn't even have a seatbelt. Uh, I think you have to retrofit them. Okay, so yeah. some of the risks you have to retrofit. Yeah. And some um, you can take. But so it's rollover bars. <laughs> Multi-layer. It is well, <laughs> doesn't have roll bars, right? I mean, some of does, the does things. That, but so some, some you have to retrofit, some you don't. Use Pop. really old gas that pollutes the environment. So that is grandfathered in, probably because there aren't many of them, and we, we, we kind of don't care. So, you, so we're kind of getting the contours of how we might do this. Right. And I think looking at other industries is how we're going to solve this. I mean, that's a really good analogy to start playing with. Right. And, and we look at this, what I, what I find very interesting is, is because it's technology, we, we want a technology solution. But some of our solutions may be right before us that we're going to actually have to yeah. conceive. On some things, it may be you have to take the risk because it's older. Right? If, if you still have an Atari and you like to play Atari, you're okay with the slowness. But if, if you want to have the newest uh, uh, PlayStation, I don't know what version they're on now, um, and you want to be connected and you want to play with somebody in Bulgaria, you take a risk. You may not know who it is in Bulgaria you're playing with. So, I, you know, I, I see some of these things. Uh, we talked a lot this morning about risk uh, a risk in this, uh, and we always have to continue. We have to continue to put the risk uh, lens when we start talking about this, because we're going to also impact customer functionality. And though it can create safety risk, some of these can actually save lives or help people. The idea that your grandmother can say, Alexa call the hospital, I'm having a heart attack, and can get somebody there? Is that worth that somebody will know that your grandmother's having a heart attack? And in that instance, getting somebody there to save her life is probably much better than the risk that her privacy may have been violated. And again, it gets to the risk. But I think sort of one of the interesting questions in the IoT space here ends up being, and Brad's touched on this a little bit, and Bruce has touched on it as well, it, that a big part of the risk in the IoT space is not borne by the consumer themselves. That when you look at sort of some of the biggest damage that has come out of IoT so far, yeah. it's things like the Mirai botnet, where you mm -hmm. are talking about yeah. people who don't even necessarily know that their device has been hijacked and don't particularly care because it doesn't necessarily impact the functioning to them. So, uh, uh, Bruce, maybe this is a question for you. Uh, how do you balance the systemic risks that, uh, you know, uh, Marine driving a 55 Thunderbird is mostly a risk to herself. Um, it, I, I, I haven't actually seen her drive, so, so <laughs> Maybe it is a, a risk to other people as well. We'll assume um, not, though. I think the purpose we'll assume, of this, this conversation. We'll assume she, it, it's mostly a risk to herself. But in IoT, you're, you're sort of letting consumers choose the, you know, the cheapest, sort of least secure device that they can and creating a systemic risk to all other internet users. And the, this is an economic externality. We know how to solve these, and it is through, through regulation mandates that, that you cannot you not, won't be allowed to harm others. Some will be, uh, so, someone said up here, the notion that, that the network will assume insecurity and have some sort of, I'm gonna make this up, immune system. And, I, and we see that talked about in home networks, that you'll be connecting any old device and the devices, and something on the network will be smart enough to know what's going on and what the devices are allowed to do. And I think there'll be something like that deeper in, in networks. I think a lot of the problem is this. I mean, it's very much a pollution problem. That your actions, you know, I buy that DVR, it costs me uh, $50, I plug it in, it's working, it's part of a couple of dozen botnets now because the Dyn code is public. It's right now being used to DOS systems. 
There's not even a red light that indicates that. I have no idea. I kind of don't care. And, and as long as that device is plugged in to, uh, to my, uh, my home, it's going to keep doing that. So we need something outside of me, outside of that consumer relationship with me and the person who sold it to me to make that work. And I think we're going to see that more and more. And again, I'm less worried about privacy and more worried about, about, about safety, about actual uh, data integrity, data availability. I mean, I'm sure I don't want someone to hack my hospital and steal my private patient and medical records, but I really don't want them changing my blood type. Right? That's worse. Brad? Uh, sort of similar question for you on, uh, you know, you, you have manufacturing background, you have retail background in this. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you look at this from the standpoint of bringing systemic risks uh, as a externality of IoT adoption? Is this something that it's fair to even ask consumers to be taking part in that conversation? I think so. I mean, when you, when you look at, so as a purchaser of security equipment, or I, I should say, as a purchaser of technology, one of the key things I look at when I look at technology is security functionality, right? Is, can I secure this technology? I think taking that same parallel and just bring it to the consumer level and bring it down a few levels to make it easy to understand. So when you're picking up the back of that box and you've got the features, you know, the competitors have you know, two check marks, you have five. Teaching them what the difference is and why there's a value in having this, I think is a, a powerful way to influence manufacturers and educate consumers about what's important. I'm not convinced you've actually met consumers. I am a consumer. Yeah, but you're a three sigma. <laughs> right? You don't count. I don't count. None of us in this room count. You know, consumers, I, I, I kind of go with Bruce. I, I was going to go, I, yeah, I just want the cheapest I mean, one. the old joke is two, if they... Two checks are good, if they I'm gave, okay. If yeah. they gave away free Big Macs for a DNA sample, there'd be lines around the block. And that's, right, that's true for so many of these things. These are hard decisions to make. And, and the obvious ones are price and features. Right? And, and the security of the general community is not a feature. It's kind of an abstract thing. And it's not something... It is rare that, thing, that consumer goods of higher morality do better. You know, and you could think of like Dolphin Safe Tuna and Fair Trade Coffee. You could think of some exceptions, but, it, but they really are exceptions. So, Maureen, how do, you, uh, how do you approach this as a manufacturer, sort of looking at this uh, IoT first principles uh, or... Are you going to go out and adopt all of these and push Johnson & Johnson to adopt all of them next Monday? Or sort of what's the, what's the Monday's next Monday's a step? holiday. So uh, Tuesday, yeah. Um, it, I'm actually going to ring the bell on Monday so, uh, <laughs> uh, with the superintendent of West Point. So, yeah. Uh, but um, I would tell you that jo Johnson & Johnson has already adopted these. Now, we have the medical devices that are regulated uh, by the FDA and those are uh, classified medical devices that we go through. But even as we go across our continuum um, as software as a medical device um, uh, and as, as it is just software, anybody do the seven minute workout, that's the Johnson & Johnson app, uh, we, we actually do the principles of security uh, and looking at our codes and pen testing, um, how it interacts with Android versus Apple iOS, uh, how it works on a computer, uh, the network, the vulnerabilities in monitoring those, um, those applications as well as the medical devices themselves. We have a lot of sensors uh, that, that we uh, utilize. Uh, we're Johnson & Johnson. Um, and we have a credo uh, that says um, in our very first paragraph, it's about our patients, our doctors, and our nurses, uh, and our employees. Uh, so I agree we may be slightly different than some companies, uh, but at, with the adoption of these principles, uh, what we're hearing uh, in technology, that companies are going to have to look at this if they want to solve uh, cybersecurity. 
Bruce is uh, extremely uh, right. I think when we came up with our principles, we had to have a multiple layered approach uh, to this. And I'm only, my product's only as good as the network it runs on. A lot of my products are in hospitals. Uh, the hospitals wanted to push all the liability of my products uh, to Johnson & Johnson. Oh, I would if I was a hospital. Yes, they would, <laughs> except for then I asked for a clause around the security of their network. Well, you can't get that. Um, so we've, we've come to an agreement. Uh, but one of those things are is that it is now going to be a layered and shared environment that we operate in. And, and you know, I don't need to put IE in products, uh, Internet Explorer into products, if they don't need to go on uh, the larger internet. And what will that look like? Mm -hmm. Will Bluetooth versus, uh, will it work? Can you limit the, the range? Those type of things become very, very important uh, in, that may not have been imp important in the past. Consumers will, Likely, I'm going to go with Bruce, consumers likely will never understand that. Will we need to have routers that have firewalls already pre-built in that don't go? Will we need um, an ability to monitor network traffic? And I'm, I, I, I put that as the collective we because I don't know if that, who that is um, uh, in, in the version of the United States that we have today. Will somebody need to monitor that traffic to see that there's bursting capabilities coming out of coffee pots all going to the Ukraine? I don't know that answer, but those will be some of the innovations uh, that we will likely. Uh, networking security is not anyone's favorite. I don't think, you know, there's a very few uh, of people who, who absolutely love that domain. Uh, but this is where we're likely going to need to put some innovation in and not just those sexy little sensors that can, the Nest cameras that can tell whether the trick-or-treaters are there or not. Well, speaking of sexy little cameras, uh, we're going to be talking about algorithms and facial recognition as part of the artificial intelligence conversation and ethics conversation up next. So thank you all for joining us, and thanks, Maureen, for some great work. Thank you. Thank you. All right.